So good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to present this panel about decent work and migrant workers. My name is Alice Neres, and I am a research assistant at the Nova BHRE Center. I would like, first of all, to thank our speakers for being here and to everyone that is involved in the organization of our annual conference, and of course, to our audience. And also a special thank you to our sponsors, PLMJ, the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and to our partners, SEDISH and NOVA for the Globe. I would like to let you know that this event is being recorded and the recording will be available in the upcoming days. In addition, I would like to invite the audience to use the Q&A button on our screen if you have any questions for our panelists during the course of the webinar. We will have a Q&A session at the end. But before we start, it is important to know that migrant workers are particularly vulnerable to different forms of abuse and discrimination, especially in the agriculture, construction and fruit produ production sectors. In particular, con uh, concerns related to the welfare and working condition of construction migrant workers involved in the infrastructure and development of projects related to the 2022 FIFA World Cup, or issues related to migrant workers in the agricultural industry in Southern Europe. Against this backdrop, it is important to reflect upon the question of how can human rights due diligence provide an adequate tool to address the systemic challenges faced by migrant workers. Today, our chair is Laura Inigo Alvarez. She is a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer in international law and SEDIS. She is also a scientific coordinator of the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. Thank you, Laura, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Alice, for the introduction and welcome everybody to this third panel on, of the annual conference on business human rights and sustainability. I would also like to thank our student and research assistants for helping out with the organization of, of this event. I know they have been working a lot behind, behind the scenes. And of course, I would like to welcome our four speakers today, uh, Aitzane, Chiara, Emeline, and Samantha. And let me first explain uh, the format of these panels. And the idea is to have a first round of interventions uh, by each speaker uh, where they will share their work they have been doing and their thoughts on the question of uh, migrant workers uh, their uh, main vulnerabilities and how business can or should reply to these uh, concerns, especially regarding human rights due diligence processes. And then we will have a round uh, of short questions uh, and answers. And finally, we will open the floor to questions or comments uh, from the audience. And as Ali said, um, remember to post your questions in the Q&A tab rather than in the in the chats and this way it's, it's easier to to see the questions so i will briefly introduce our speakers and and then we can start uh, we have today uh, Itzane marquez who is the senior attorney at women's link worldwide an international uh, non-profit organization that uses the power of the law to promote social change that advances the rights of women and she's also enrolled in a PhD law uh, at the University Carlos III of Madrid, working on corporate responsibility for human rights violations from a gender perspective. Uh, we also have uh, Chiara Maki, uh, who is a lecturer in law at the Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And in the past two years, she has led uh, EU funded Marie Curie research project focusing on business and human rights in the policies uh, of the European Union. And her recent research has focused uh, on the climate change dimensions of business and human rights. Uh, she has also co-authored a research project, uh, research report on the role of human rights and environmental due diligence legislation in protecting women migrant workers, which maybe she will explain later on. And third speaker today is from Portugal, uh, Emeline de Oliveira, uh, who is a co-founder and executive coordinator of the Nova Refugee Clinic, uh, a PhD candidate in new migration law, 
at NOVA School of Law and a researcher at CEDIS and the Research Center on Law and Society. And her research uh, focuses on how security concerns shape uh, migration law in the European Union. And last but not least, we have Samantha Goethals, who is an assistant professor uh, in business and society at Schema Business School in France. And her research uh, focuses on, on the meaning and translation of human rights uh, in business organizations, the responsibility of business in context of forced migration, including the protection and integration of, of refugees and human rights education in business schools. And she has also worked with uh, several British NGOs in the field of business and human rights and co-authored several policy reports based uh, on fieldwork uh, in different countries. So again, a warm welcome to all of you. And let's start with uh, Aitzane. Um, I know you have been working on the issue of migrant workers uh, in the south of Spain, especially on women migrant workers. So maybe you can share uh, your work and your ideas uh, about this. So please, Aitzane. Thank you, Laura, very much for the invitation to participate in this panel and for the presentation. Um, I want to start by saying something that might seem a bit obvious, but it's that um, because gender-based discrimination intersects with factors including race, uh, social economic factors, and migration status, female workers, migrant female workers, often experience violations of their human rights in ways which are unique to the gender. And that being said, and focusing on the experience of female migrant workers in the south of Spain, on, in Huelva, I feel like this experience of these women are unfortunately a paradigmatic example of the nexus between gender, migration, and corporate human rights abuses. Um, I want to be, keep, give a big uh, uh, background information and um, it's important to know that each year there is a bilateral agreement between Spain and Morocco. And within this bilateral agreement, um, female workers come each year from Morocco to Spain to work in the seasonal work of uh, picking strawberries in the south of Spain in Huelva. And this region is one of the main exporters of strawberries globally. In 2020, uh, this region exported 280,000 uh, tons of strawberries globally, which is a lot. And as you can imagine, um, for this very intensive agricultural production, there is a need of lots of seasonal workers. And in Huelva in particular, there are some that live in informal settlements around the farmlands, and mainly these are undocumented migrant workers, but also there is these um, women that come every year annually uh, to pick berries under this bilateral agreement that I was speaking about. And for instance, before the pandemic, there were almost 20,000 Moroccan women coming to Spain during the harvest season. So the difference between these uh, migrant workers that live in informal settlements is that these women live in the farmlands, in, in the companies. Uh, so despite the fact that this situation around Huelva has been said to be going, or this, the complicated situation has been going for a lot of years, it was not until 2018 that a lot of reports in the media about exploitative, exploitative uh, conditions, uh, physical abuse, sexual assaults, and raci racism gained wider attention. And that is when us, Women's Link, started representing for women before the courts. And we also from there started um, identifying some other human rights violation, conducting uh, research in the field with other organizations. I think that with that background, what we have ident identified as some human rights violations with a gender specific um, um, situation is that even if the um, agreement between Morocco and Spain does not state um, selection criteria. In practice, there is a discriminatory um, selection criteria that it's that women are uh, sought for a number of reasons, not least because they are typically thought to be more docile, more careful, and more hardworking than men. Another unofficial criteria would be that workers are the heads of their household and have young children. Many of these women are divorced or widow, and as their families remain in Morocco, during the picking season, then 
this measure effectively assures that the women will come back to their countries when they finish these contracts in Spain. So playing on this role of women as mothers, as caregivers, and um, some companies take advantage of their position of uh, vulnerability and impose very abusive labor conditions with impunity, knowing that these women will not challenge them. So the, the whole situation, again, as women puts them at risk of suffering gender specific violence, sexual violence, sexual harassment, which they cannot denounce because they are going to lose their jobs. It's very difficult for these women to access remedy because um, these women, their work permit and resident permit are linked to the company that is employing, is, um, employing them, so they cannot change companies. Also, there is a nominative system in place, which means that once you come to work for a company, then that company has to ask for you for the following seasons or campaigns. So that means that there, there is a total dependence on these companies for continued employment in the future. So as you can imagine, these workers do not want to risk and denounce what is going on in, in the fields because they lose the chance of re-employment. And that means that their families would not have this support. Again, when these women um, try to access justice, they face significantly practical barriers in that they are physically isolated. As I said, they live in the farmlands. They are also socially isolated because they cannot speak the local language and they have limited contact with local people. And of course, they are hindered by the lack of information that they receive on their human rights and the mechanisms that they have to denounce. And of course, there's also a, a lack of trust in the police. Most, more importantly, I think it's important to acknowledge too that there are persistent inequalities in how women and men access to justice, gender bias and stereotypes in the justice system result in equal access to, um, for these women to justice. So at the end, I think that it's important to recognize that it's positive that there is a model which allows migrant women to come and to Spain with a legal framework, but the issue is that these systems cannot allow to continue with business as usual, as it happens in Huelva at the expense of workers' human rights. Thank you so much, Ainsane. And now I'm moving to um, Chiara and also related to some of the issues uh, Ainsane mentioned probably. Um, as I said before, you, you recently co-authored a report on human rights on the role of human rights due diligence legislation in protecting uh, women and uh, migrant workers. So maybe you can tell us more about this and the upcoming EU directive, Chiara? Uh, yes, thank you, Laura, and thank you, Antane, for this extremely interesting uh, presentation. Um, yes, I co-authored this report with uh, Daniel uh, Augenstein for uh, ActionAid, Oxfam, and Our Food, Our Future. And today I will touch upon um, this issue about uh, the, on the issue whether the EU Directive on Mandatory Human Rights and Environmental Due Diligence could potentially enhance protection of vulnerable workers in general in the supply chain, and in particular migrant workers and uh, women mi migrant workers. Um, uh, let me uh, start by saying that, uh, as you might know, uh, we don't have the text of the Commission's proposal yet. Um, that will most likely be published uh, at the beginning of next month. Uh, what we do have is the official proposal put forward by the European Parliament earlier uh, this year, trying, of course, to influence the shape and the contents of the Commission's proposal. Uh, first of all, um, the scope of the Parliament's proposal. Uh, this is interesting because uh, the, the Parliament's proposal covers business enterprises domiciled in the European Union, but also foreign undertakings that operate in the internal market, selling goods or providing services. Um, it covers uh, big enterprises, but also small and medium-sized enterprises that are publicly listed or operate in high-risk sectors. Of course, the definition of high-risk sectors here uh, would be crucial. Uh, in my opinion, uh, it should definitely include sectors such as, for instance, the agri-food sector or the garment industry, in which poor labor conditions and the exploitation of migrant workers uh, are largely prevalent, and not only in developing countries, as the, 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 the prevalent narrative goes, uh, but also in Europe itself, as Einstein's presentation has just highlighted. 
another interesting feature of the Parliament's proposal is the requirements that companies map uh, their entire supply chain and publicly disclose relevant information about it, including the names, locations, types of products, uh, and other information about their subsidiaries and suppliers. Knowing the chain can be an important step towards uh, unearthing cases of illegal subcontracting or abusive intermediaries, potentially making it easier for societal watchdogs to monitor the most problematic sections of the supply chain. However, it is worrying uh, in the Parliament's proposal that certain enterprises can be exempt from putting in place a due diligence strategy if their risk assessment yields the conclusion that they do not cause, contribute, or are directly linked to adverse impacts. In this case, they are even exempt from mapping their supply chain, which to me is counterintuitive. How can you be certain that your supply chain is risk-free if you don't even map it first? So this exemption is foreseen for large undertakings whose direct business relationships are domiciled within the union, but we know very well that this is no guarantee at all, especially when it comes to exploitation of migrant workers in highly problematic sectors. Um, of course, strawberry harvest in, in, in Spain, but also tomato fields in southern Italy, for instance. Um, this exemption indirectly introduces a tire-based limitation to supply chain due diligence that is not in line with the UN GPs, with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Indeed, in the new directive, it will be very important to extend uh, due diligence obligations to the entire supply chain. Um, arguably, an approach like the one adopted in the recent German law, for instance, uh, only covering direct suppliers, uh, leaves out uh, of systematic due diligence checks precisely the most vulnerable workers uh, at the end of the supply chain, uh, including women migrant workers. Uh, a positive feature of the Parliament's definition of due diligence is that it incorporates the enterprise's purchasing policies. Um, enterprises shall ensure that their purchase policies do not cause or contribute to potential or actual adverse impacts on human rights. This is the, the Parliament's proposal. Um, this is a very important provision because it is hypocritical and counterproductive to require suppliers to respect certain standards when labor exploitation is actually incentivized by the buyer's purchasing practices. Uh, also, the, the, parliam the Parliament's proposal contains provisions of civil liability according to which an enterprise can be held liable for human rights and environmental harm occurring in its entire supply chain, provided that the enterprise caused or contributed to the adverse impacts. Um, in these scenarios, the directive appears to envisage strict liability for human rights and environmental harm, coupled with a due diligence defense. And this is a potentially um, important provision. Um, in conclusion, the upcoming directive on mandatory human rights due diligence has the potential to enhance protection of migrant workers. Uh, importantly, the directive will uh, not only exist uh, in a vacuum, uh, but rather within a system in which uh, uh, other important instruments exist already. For instance, the directive on unfair trading practices in the agricultural and food supply chain but also um, recently we have seen uh, the guidance provided under the farm to fork strategy. This is not, uh, let, let's say, a hard law instrument, but uh, the code of conduct for responsible food business and marketing practices might constitute a non-binding guidance uh, towards uh, uh, businesses that will need to abide by the upcoming directive. Um, importantly, the directive, the directive on mandatory due diligence will be the first cross-sectoral instrument to impose due diligence obligations on companies based or, or operating in the European market, regardless of the sector, um, and using the language of human rights, which is not really a prevalent uh, language, let's say, in, in the domestic debates uh, when it comes to protecting the, the rights of migrant workers, at least I speak for my own country in which the issue of protecting uh, migrant workers is extremely uh, topical and yet, uh, 
the topic is addressed through a lot of rhetoric, but definitely not uh, in the language of human rights, not even uh, on the part of those uh, political forces that are actually aiming at protecting those rights. So um, arguably a directive of this kind could help bring the debate at a higher level, or at least this is the hope. However, it will be very important for the EU institutions to seize this once in a lifetime opportunity and carefully craft the directive in line with the UN guiding principles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chiara. And I think we will have time later also to, to discuss uh, some of these elements. Thank you for highlighting the main uh, aspects of the directive. I think there are some interesting elements, the application throughout different sectors, the, the issue of civil liability, I think it's also important. And later on, we will go back to some of these issues. Uh, I will move now to move on to uh, Emeline. And uh, similarly to the case of Spain, uh, there have been serious concerns about the, the vulnerability of migrant workers in the south of Portugal, uh, especially in, in the Alentejo area. Uh, so maybe you can explain a bit uh, what's the situation, why it's necessary to, to take uh, urgent action in, in these areas. Uh, so Emily, you, you have the floor. Emily, can you hear us? Maybe there is some connection issues. Not sure is. Otherwise, we can move to. I'm not sure if Emily, can you hear us? Okay, yes, now. now, yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. So uh, I, 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 I'm so sorry if I didn't hear the question, but I suppose it's about the, the situation in the south end of Portugal. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to talk about this topic, even if it's brief. But I, I do think this is important, especially because in the beginning of 2021, so this year, we in Portugal were quite of surprise with many photos and from the media with Im images of migrant workers in this man and degraded situation in a specific place, which is Odimira in Alentejo in southern of Portugal. And this was quite complicated because we were also in the middle of a pandemic situation and you saw images of people like hundreds, not hundreds, but like 20, 30 in a small rooms place, one, one room places, and uh, everybody was thinking about the situation. Actually, uh, most of them were working in the agriculture sector and especially on the clam and red fruit picking. Uh, poor housing and work conditions were reported at that time, but also trafficking in human beings for labor exploitation purpose. Also, most of them arrived in Portugal through mediators, mostly temporary work agencies. At that time, the attention was towards the Portuguese immigration law, whose Article 88, Number 2, established a regime that's known in Portugal, in Portugal as a legalization of migrants to work. Um, just to make a, a fast explanation on that, in 2017, there was an amendment in the immigration law that turned into a right, not anymore a decision on the discretion of the administration, the possibility of granting residence permits for undocumented workers that, were, uh, that would have a work contract or at least a promise of having a work contract. However, it was another amendment that uh, brought some controversial opinions. For those foreigners who could not prove their legal entry in Portugal, uh, this legal entry could be presumed if they were contributing to the Portuguese tax and social security systems for at least one year. So in the case of Admira, uh, some argued that those law the, those law amendment actually were the source of this exploitation that you saw in Alentejo. I'd rather say that I do think differently. Uh, and I would like just to point out some ideas on it. The first one, be 
contributing to the social security system does not imply social protection. Actually, in order to be able to have benefits from the social security system alongside of being contributing to it, it's necessary to have valid residence permit. In other words, the undocumented migrants were contributing to the system without being covered by social protection in case, for example, of unemployment, sick leave, all of them. Actually, they were contributing in order to have the possibility of starting a legalization process. And, and actually, reports uh, in Portugal regarding the social contribution of migrants uh, show that the high amount that foreign workers normally provide to the social security system and the difference, I mean, the gap between the contributions and the use of those benefits, exactly because not that they do not get sick, but they just can't use the, the benefits. The second point that I would like to, to point out today is the facilitation of opening a company in Portugal. Since 2005, uh, there is a regime that facilitates uh, uh, to open a company in Portugal, which is, of course, important to the economy and brought men entrepreneurs to Portugal. However, uh, what I would like to focus is in the possibility of opening a company with one euro of minimum share capital, which since 2011, of course, uh, uh, it was a kind of pull factor for numbers and numbers of temporary work agencies here in Portugal. At the same time, we have another regime that it was established in 2005, which is called Empresa na Hora free translation, company right now. That helps to open the company, actually having the constitutive acts previously approved. So what, what do you have also as the third point, and then I will sum up the three points that I was talking. It was an amendment in the labor code uh, in 2016, I'm sorry. In 2016, it was created in special cases of responsibility of the temporary work company and the user undertaking. Actually, it was two points. The first one, the signing of a contract for the use of temporary work by an unlicensed temporary work company rangers uh, make them also liable for the workers' credits arising for the work contract, its branch or termination for the last three years, as well as for the corresponding social charges. Uh, also, uh, the, in the change of the, the, the labor worker, we had that a temporary work agency and the user of the temporary worker, as well as their respective managers, administrators, or directors, as well as companies that are in a reciprocal holding, controlling, or group relationship with a temporary work agency or use of temporary work, are subsidiary responsible for the work's credit and for the corresponding social costs as well as for the payment of the respective fines. So trying already to sum up is, so if you have all this, so why do you have the cases like Odimira? I dare to say that's not for the lack of legislation trying at least to protect migrant workers, but it's for the lack of inspection and enforcement of the same legislation. In summary, it cannot be denied that the chance to the immigration law regarding the creation of a regularization regime through work can be a factor of attraction for irregular migrants. However, legalization is the first step for these workers, regardless of the migratory status, to be guaranteed the social and labor protection which they are entitled as taxpayers. Furthermore, this legalization also opens space to fight labor exploitation since it empowers the workers before the company, since he or she is not vulnerable for his or her migratory status to report possible cases of abuse. Furthermore, the need to, on the one hand, closely control temporary work companies that hire workers mainly for seasonal agriculture and, 
on the other hand, to make all elements of administrative body of a temporary work company responsible for the credits of the work as a corresponding social charge as provided for in the Article 174 of the Portuguese Labor Code. And this last idea is in line with the ideals of the proposal of an, an EU due diligence directive, which aims to put the ultimate responsibility for due diligence sorry, due diligence on each individual company while equipping victims of abuse and their representative to hold companies accountable. And this protection should pay attention to immigrant workers who are most susceptible to labor abuse, to their irregular migratory status or under the possibility of becoming irregular. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for uh, giving this overview of the situation in, in Alentejo and pointing out sometimes it's not the lack of legislation, but the lack of inspection, as, as you were saying. And now I will move to uh, Samantha. And uh, in your case, um, I know you have been working on migrant workers' rights in context of unfreedom and what human rights due diligence can do to address harm in, around, and beyond work. So I think we all know, we all want to know more about these questions and your thoughts. So please, uh, the floor is yours, Samantha. Thanks a lot, Laura, for this introduction. And thanks to my co-panelists for those very interesting discussion on the actual legal framework. Um, as uh, Laura explained, I work in a business school. I'm focusing on business and society. And I'm particularly interested uh, because, uh, into the context in which business operates, but also the organizational process through which human rights due diligence should be embedded in, um, in companies. Um, as my background in uh, social science also brings me to look into um, the social relationship that happen around a question of discrimination and inequality of migrant workers. So there's various dimensions that we also need to unpick when uh, we think about companies um, implementing their human rights due diligence for migrant workers and type of exploitation that exists in the recruitment chain as well as in their site of operation. But I'd like, to, I'd like us to start by giving some thought to this context in which companies are coming to operate in. Um, yesterday, we heard that over 30 migrants had passed and died in the channel between France and the UK, right? The message here, and that we're given from our governments right now, from the UK, France, perhaps the whole of Europe, is a reinforcement of Frontex. It's securitization. It's unwelcoming of refugees, of people seeking asylum, as well as people who want to find a better living, better living and economic condition on our shores. So this message is important. It's not solely in Europe. It's also in the US and in many countries in Asia. Um, and we have other countries which rely a lot on migrant workers, but do not always give them the best condition for them to be free and operate as economic agent uh, as we would like. So what is a message to companies here? And what is a message to people who work in those companies? That needs to also be taken into account. Uh, we have a context which is pretty much anti-immigration in many countries. Uh, and what is the role of companies therein, right? Uh, how do we have to cope with perhaps immigration laws, but labor laws that will actually impinge on the rights and freedoms of workers, of migrant workers? So do they have to stand up? challenge the state to enable them to do their human rights due diligence and actually respect the rights of migrant workers for working for themselves? Or uh, should they just stand by and not take a stand on the kind of discriminatory attitude that there is in society, but also among the people working within the organization? And this needs to be questioned in the sense that uh, we are asking companies to really do human rights due diligence, protect, respect uh, the rights of migrant workers throughout their supply chains, identify the site of, uh, of risks that exist, the practices that risk uh, migrants' uh, uh, rights and, uh, and livelihoods, send them into very precarious situation. But what should they do in context which actually limits 
those rights and those freedoms. So this really needs to be questioned. And perhaps these are good questions also for the European directive as such. Uh, should they also ask company in their human rights due diligence to take into account those legal structures that limit the freedoms of migrant workers, that is, limit their access to certain rights, for instance, the right of uh, the freedom of association, the freedom uh, from move, uh, of movement, which is very important, and in some cases, the freedom to choose decent work, uh, as it were. So these are, are important aspects. Should companies stand up for the rights of migrants? But um, should they also engage with what is happening within uh, there are other fields of women, the social relations that will restrict the ability of workers to claim their rights and the practices that do so de facto. Uh, so uh, we can think, for instance, I mean, if we think about the work Claire Wright and I have done uh, on uh, looking at the, the, the responsibility of construction companies in Qatar to consider the situation in which migrant workers find themselves in, around, and beyond work, that is inside the workplace, around the workplace, the society in which migrant workers find themselves in their host communities, um, where they live, where they sleep, where they take transport, where they access health and so on and so forth, the basic needs that we have. And also beyond, uh, those companies are recruiting, for instance, in the case of uh, construction companies in Qatar, they are recruiting and highly reliant on migrant workers coming from Nepal, coming from India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and the like, all of which have very different um, legislation, regulation around immigration and labor and so on and so forth. Um, so should they also carry on their human right due diligence in the recruitment chain, the migration life cycle, as it were. Uh, so many uh, instruments have been developed around this. They point to the risk of indebtment, which is one of the main risks that leads people to forced labor. Uh, it, um, and then the, the risk of not having access to your documents when you're in the countries where you're living in. So these are all very important practice to identify that exist in the way that agents, recruitment agents, brokers deal with migrant workers from the moment they seek work to the moment they are recruited, deployed, and then eventually uh, employed in the country, in their host countries. But this is also underpinned with certain social uh, relationship of discrimination between genders, between ethnies um, and so on and so forth, also be around sexuality. So, you know, should company get into that to understand those sites of inequalities and unfreedom, those barriers put on workers to actually be able to ad uh, advance their, their agents, claim their right, and then stand up for free work, as it were. Uh, so that's through the migrant workers, uh, the, the recruitment chain. And then in the space where they are being employed, the country where they arrive, um relationship might not be that welcoming. Uh, in the case of Qatar, 90% of the workforce is immigrant, uh, which means that there is a lot of, you know, uh, should all these people be included within the society or should they stay within this site of exclusion to provide or receive for the Qatari society? Uh, so it's a very special country, as it were. And this, this does matter. This perhaps also shapes the, the, the social relationship that migrant workers will have with their hosts, but also the laws that are put in there to privilege the national society. So where do companies fit into that? How do human rights due diligence can provide for this protection to overcome the social norm and social relationship that will be and might be discriminatory uh, against migrant workers or certain type of migrant workers? We also need to realize that obviously, it is based on race, uh, a topic that is not often talked about in the business and human rights world, but this, this does matter in the sense that color might not uh, give you the best uh, type of working condition. So the darker you are, perhaps the more discriminated you will be. Uh, and all societies might have different cleavage of race. And that's something that also needs to be taken into account. What's the role of a company, a lead company in um, over all their, their, their relationship to challenge this type of behavior, right? So it's not just about the law changing and making more space to migrant workers, but also an identification of how to overcome this type of relationship. What is the message? Do companies actually have uh, 
a role in spreading human rights, as it were, in their, in their supply chains through their human rights due diligence. So we need to think about this. Uh, I'm saying that also because in Qatar, we've seen that labor laws, the kafala law that was requiring that migrant workers had an employer sponsor in order to come into the country and that employer sponsor would have the authority to allow the person to change work and return to their country of origins is now being changed. But will this actually change the social relationship that have existed in the country for a very long time? Will it change the customary norms that underpin the kafala law overnight? Perhaps not. So again, what is the, the, the responsibility of a company like Vinci or another of these uh, Italian companies that operate in Qatar into changing those norms beyond the FIFA World Cup 2020, right? Uh, so these are all very important questions that we need to ask beyond the changes of law, beyond the regulation that has company to respect the rights of workers. Where do we stop? Where does that go? And, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and then a final point, we have, um, uh, within the, the country, so around work, uh, in, the, in this framework we're looking at, we hear that it's very difficult for migrant workers to actually have access to remedy. So it might be because of the law, for sure. It's difficult to access the law in, uh, in Qatar for migrant workers. But how about the company's own practices? When the company controls the accommodation site, when the company controls the public transport or the transport that leads the migrant workers into the city center who, where they could maybe access a lawyer, what, what does that mean? Is there also a role to freeze those spaces, to stop controlling the movement of migrant workers in the country in order for them to be able to access remedies? So these are also practices, relationship between the organization and the migrant workers that need to be looked into, not just the role of the law. So here are my points. We need to contextualize where HRDD will happen so much in the legal context as well as the political context and the social relationship that basically frame um, the role that uh, an organization might have uh, for its migrant workforce. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha, for bringing these this new elements and contextualize as well and whether the, the responsibility of, of companies to address these uh, situations around and beyond work, as you mentioned, and the different type of discrimination faced uh, by migrant workers. And I, I'm gonna start with some questions and following up with Samantha actually, uh, to some of the, the ideas she was mentioning. I would like to ask, um, when considering the, the role of employees and workers in, in due diligence processes, how can we turn uh, their role from passive recipients to active participants in this process? And maybe how can we ensure that their engagement is uh, actually uh, meaningful in this process? Well, this is always a very tough question. <laughs> Thank you, Lara. Um, I think a key point, and that's based on the, the research I did for my PhD in this case, so different research, um, question of knowledge and power over rights are key. Uh, in the sense that when I did my, my research uh, for my PhD, I looked at the meaning of human rights in the hotel sector in the UK, wherein I spoke uh, about, um, uh, I spoke to migrant workers, in the hotel sector, often outsourced in the, in the cleaning part of, um, of, the, of the hotels, but I also spoke to operation managers and top managers. So what does that wrote is basically that there is very different understanding of human rights uh, in many cases uh, across the different level, but there is also a huge lack of knowledge at all levels. Uh, and this is something that I'm also finding in, uh, in, my, in my classes where I teach human rights in a, in a business course. So this is meaningful in the sense that uh, we will have different actors in this case, from the migrant workers or the, um, the workers to the management who have widely different understanding, widely different knowledges of human rights and might not be actually able to engage with the subject matter. I mean, we might not always want to speak about human rights in a in an organization, but these are all key aspects. So yes, you can speak about diversity, you can speak about inclusion, but that does not bring forward the injustices that human rights would actually flag. Now, um, during my research um, in the UK, I spoke to migrant workers who were coming from Latin America, 
at the time, uh, and those who were able to engage with human rights, or at least uh, willing to, to engage with it so much in, uh, in a way where we're conversing about it, but also in practice were those who were able to join a trade union. So again, we were in a sector that is very poorly um, uh, unionized, the hotel sector in the UK. This is the case in many countries for migrant workers anyway, because often they are not allowed to join trade union and not allowed to, to freely associate uh, and uh, negotiate with their, uh, their employer. So this is uh, not possible. So that undermines their power. Uh, so we see maybe there is a point for the states to open up the space of freedom of association and negotiation uh, in their law for migrant workers that would give them the power to negotiate their working conditions. But so there is a, a need for trade unions and whichever organization that is, wor that is working uh, in support of migrant workers to actually educate them in their rights. Uh, so this is key. Um, and so it is a role for uh, the society as a whole, government, business school, school of laws to actually educate people about human rights. Uh, I mean, it's incredible to come in a, a, a class of a French student and ask them about human rights and they are not even able to name the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What does that mean for the future of management? These are kids who are 20, 21 years old, 22 years old, probably don't care about human rights, okay, uh, but still, it also reflects on the education they've had in the past. We are in a country where the rule of law and human rights are praised, but the population in itself is not able to actually engage with the idea of this. So it comes at different level. If we want our workers to be able to engage meaningfully uh, in the process of human rights due diligence, engage with their employers, if we've gone beyond industrial relation, there is also means, perhaps organizational relation, I don't know. But education is key, knowledge of human rights at all levels, from workers to operational managers to directors. And stop this idea that human rights are only something that happened in Syria, in Africa, but also take place in our countries. Uh, and then obviously what um, my co-panelists have talked about earlier, what happens in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, are all too real to bring human rights back home. Uh, and yeah, they should certainly look into that. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha and Dean. I think it's the importance of educating in human rights at all levels, and as you mentioned as well, and the university as well. And I'm gonna move to Emily because uh, I know she has to leave earlier. So maybe I will briefly ask her, um, uh, in relation to what she was explaining in the situation of the south of Portugal, and I know there have been some um, uh, interest in improving housing conditions of seasonal workers, but I would like to ask what should be the most uh, urgent measures that need to be tackled in this context, Emily. Thank you, Lara. Um, well, I believe that the housing issue is on a small part of the problem. To guarantee decent work conditions without abusing the migratory status of all the migrant workers who need the contract to, to regularize their status or to remain regular in Portuguese territory. I would say that greater control, inspection and enforcement of the protective legislation in force is necessary. But it's also obvious, at least for me, that this will only be possible if there is government investment in the human resources needed to ensure the necessary supervision and maybe not only fine for companies but also maybe prizes and recognition for those who follow the fully uh, and protective law that we have so uh, maybe we just think about uh, uh, to control and to apply fines but maybe another way of uh, try to improve these protective environment, for example, with the recognition for those who follow the law. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And maybe also uh, looking at the situation of Spain and migrant workers at Sane, uh, which recommendations would you give to both states and, and companies to, to better protect the human rights of migrant workers and in particular of women and migrant workers, what are the key uh, things 
Um, yeah, well, I think that um, to, to include a, a gender transformative approach to this uh, issue, there's a need to um, frame the problem from the beginning from a gender perspective. And for that, uh, and then from there, uh, the, what happens to female migrant workers should cut across all stages of due diligence and uh, taking into account different forms of uh, discrimination, such as race, migration status, and others. And I think that focusing maybe on, on how um, these migrant female workers access to justice or besides adopting, I think, a legal framework in Spain is needed uh, to, to address a human rights due diligence. Um, there's a need to consider how to um, change discriminatory uh, power structures in access in how uh, these migrant workers access justice. And I feel like um, there's a need not only to increase labor inspections, but also to ensure that labor inspectors are trained and are sensitive to gender forms of violence and specific uh, abuses that migrant workers suffer. And from there, of course, companies should also include uh, due diligence protocols with a gender perspective, but their risk assessments should also be based on sex, disaggregated data, and adverse effects that may uh, be facing be, may face migrant workers. And also, remedial uh, measures should also be targeted to consider gender specific abuses. And I think that, um, as Samantha was saying, I think that that it's key to involve. Um, both uh, women organizations and uh, migrant organizations on uh, how to monitor and make recommendations on these processes, but also to involve the workers themselves in deciding uh, what these um, policies should include and what is happening uh, to them in, in, in the field. And that would be like major recommendations that I think that are fundamental. Thank you, Aitzani. Yeah, I think it's it's key to include them as stakeholders in the process as well. And Chiara, um, maybe for you, and uh, you have been talking about the upcoming directive and a mandatory human rights due diligence. So I would like to know uh, how do you see the the relationship with the upcoming directive, and then the EU directive on unfair trading practices in the agricultural food supply chain. Maybe if you can give us some ideas. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, of course, it is an important relationship. Um, the, the directive on unfair trading practices in the agricultural and food supply chain uh, was adopted to protect primar primary agricultural producers and suppliers of agricultural and food products, uh, protect them against the so-called unfair trading practices, meaning those practices in business to business relationships that deviate from good commercial conduct and are contrary to good faith and fair dealing. Um, the, EU, the EU recognizes that the food supply chain in particular is vulnerable to such practices. Uh, and this is due to stark imbalances in the bargaining power of small and large operators. And it goes without saying that vulnerable workers like migrant workers, women migrant workers can easily become the victims of this uh, David versus Goliath uh, dynamics. Uh, the directive on unfair trading practices in some respects actually goes beyond uh, due diligence. Uh, it does not only impose due diligence obligations, it, uh, it actually imposes an outright ban on certain practices. So certain practices are not acceptable under the directive. For instance, delayed payments for uh, food products, uh, short notice cancellations of orders, refusal of written confirmation of supply agreements and unilateral changes of contract, all practices that are very much common in not only, of course, in the food supply chain, eh, but also in the garment sector, for instance. Um, the transfer of certain risks and costs to the supplier, uh, commercial retaliation by the buyer, these are all practices that are considered no-go, like black black practices, uh, not acceptable. Um, other unfair trading practices are, are considered gray practices. Uh, they are permitted subject to prior clear and an ambiguous agreement between the parties. For instance, the return of unsold products, 
And this might be actually problematic given the, again, the big imbalances in the bargaining power of the parties involved, uh, sometimes even you know, a clear and an ambiguous uh, consent might be, uh, or agreement might be uh, difficult to ascertain. Um, anyway, ensuring that the trading and purchasing practices of big market players do not place an unfair burden on their business partners is fundamental uh, to prevent human rights due diligence from becoming an empty exercise. Um, indeed, uh, uh, it does not make sense uh, to request a supplier to respect certain labor rights, human rights or environmental standards, while at the same time squeezing it for low costs and strict delivery deadlines. This will only put a, a huge burden on the supplier without actually allowing it to, to comply with such standards. And Laura, I also have some reactions to my colleagues' uh, speeches. But sure, I please go, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yes, because I think many interesting things came out. For instance, uh, uh, Samantha talked about the, you know, the responsibilities of corporations in context in which human rights violations are basically endemic and they are uh, related to uh, legal but also social norms uh, in the host country. Now, if we look at the black letter of the UNGPs, they are very clear that corporations have a responsibility to protect that goes beyond uh, that, is in, that exists independently of the state's duty to protect human rights. So in other words, uh, corporations should try to respect internationally protected human rights, even in context in which uh, um, the local uh, norms do not protect them sufficiently. Um, this, of course, it's easier to, to say than to do in practice, but for instance, in a country that does not recognize trade unions, uh, corporations could still find a way without calling it trade union to allow for some degree of workers representation, uh, just to make an example. However, um, of course, the, the, the new directive could potentially open the European courts, the courts of member states to uh, workers that are exploited in other parts of the world, but that are part of a supply chain um, um, that touches upon the European market. Um, this means that they might potentially have access to courts in Europe when they don't have, uh, for instance, access to the, to the court of the host uh, country. Again, this is in practice difficult because transnational litigation is difficult. Um, the victims do not only need a cause for action, they also need representation, expert representation, and this is not always present um, in the relevant uh, state. Uh, they need resources, they need time. Uh, so, of course, many barriers still uh, would exist and would have to be tackled some other way. Uh, so, to be honest, even in this respect, the directive will, will not be the silver bullet. Um, as concerns the, the, the social, um, you know, um, um, social benefits for uh, migrant workers, I am afraid that even in the European space, there is still a lot to be done. And um, for instance, the seasonal workers directive uh, has been pretty much criticized. Uh, uh, because, uh, as also Samantha was saying, Samantha was mentioning this uh, securitization uh, tendency you know, against the protection of uh, people uh, per se. Well, also in the Seasonal Workers Directive, we see this tension because the directive was based on the EU competence um, to regulate uh, the migration of uh, third country nationals as opposed to, to social policy as a legal basis. And this reinforces the idea that after all, the main uh, goal of the directive was to manage uh, migration more than to protect rights. Uh, indeed, Article 23 uh, says that uh, uh, seasonal workers are entitled to equal treatment with national uh, of member states uh, in terms, for instance, of strike, employment uh, term, terms of employment, and so on. But exceptions can be made with regard to social security benefits, and this include the, uh, includes sickness benefits, but also maternity benefits, uh, family benefits, uh, unemployment, accidents on the workplace. So um, we are still far also in the European area from having fully protected uh, um, vulnerable workers. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Chiara. I'm not sure if Emily still has some time because I see some questions and maybe if you still have some moments, I will now um, ask some questions from the Q&A and then we have one for uh, Emily uh, from Sara Felix. Uh, in practice, uh, what do you think and that is necessary to do regarding the, so the social security system situation in Portugal in order uh, to migrant workers effectively benefit from it. And uh, thank you. Yeah. yeah, one minute because I have a class is starting now. <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, I think the question of Sarah goes uh, towards to declares one. Um, actually, uh, um, do not have only the, the valid residence permit in order to access the social benefits. It would be already a change. And actually, this is not impossible. Here in Portugal in 2020, and I, I, read, I would say that uh, all Europe and even the world heard about the temporary regularization of migrants that you have done in 2020 due to the pandemic, showed us that it is possible to uh, guarantee access to social rights for those who are at least in the beginning of the legalization so if for regularize themselves they can show only the work contract or at least as the law says a promise of work contract and that person can start to work and contribute maybe the same documents could be used for starting to also benefit of this of this of the social uh, 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 protection. And uh, uh, I would like to address really fast to the Mariana's ones, because I do think that it's interesting to make the difference between uh, the traffic and the pure exploitation of work migrants, especially because in this case, the most part of people that were trafficked, they will never regularize themselves. Actually, they will be exploited at the most as the, the traffickers can do it in order to take benefits from those people. Another thing is the smuggling, that uh, it's only to help or to support people to arrive here. It's another crime, of course, but uh, it's another thing. And the exploitation that those migrants suffered here in Portugal, that sometimes there's nothing to do with the with those who helped them to arrive here. So uh, I, I do think that's a different thing regarding the trafficking. The judiciary police and even the immigration police, so SAF, uh, they work and they have investigation on that. But uh, the case of trafficking related to the regularization, I don't think that you can just make this direct connection because even it could be worse saying that we don't have to regularize migrants because they, they can be used in traffic chains and actually regularize them. It's to give them the possibility to access rights. So uh, I think it's the other way around. Thank you very much. I do have to go and congratulations to all my dear colleagues. I think it was wonderful. It was really a pleasure to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emily. And uh, we will continue with some questions. Um, I think there is also one from Samantha. Uh, it says, and you spoke about three dimensions of due diligence in relation to migrant workers in, around, and beyond work. Why it's important to have a specific lens to due diligence in relation to migrant workers, Samantha? I'm not sure if you understood it. Yeah, sorry. Do you, you mind? You can see it. it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure it. I got the question right there. Uh, you spoke about three dimensions of due diligence in relation to migrant workers in, around, and beyond work. Why it's important to have a specific lens to due diligence in relation to migrant workers? So I mentioned this um, framework or conceptual framework to understand where human right due diligence should happen. Uh, when uh, companies are relying heavily on migrant workforces and in a number of sectors that we've heard today do, uh, and they also do in certain countries. Uh, so we heard about Qatar, 90% of the workforce is uh, of immigrant background. Singapore also relies heavily uh, in certain sectors on migrant workers. Um, but the impact of lead companies, so often foreign companies that find and uh, have contracts 
bid for contracts in the construction sector, I'll take this as an example, in a foreign countries with laws that manage uh, or control migration heavily uh, by placing employment related um, uh, restriction on, uh, on what migrant workers can do in terms of movement and all that, um, need to, to go beyond just understanding how their own operation in the country might exacerbate uh, existing sites of inequality and restriction on the migrant workers. So I mentioned in and around in the sense that the lead company will have leverage over its direct contractors that are involved in constructing the building. Um, and so obviously uh, direct linkage or direct uh, uh, impact leverage on uh, what's happening in the workplace. So we've so basically um, that many of the, the Western companies operating in Qatar had to develop stringent health and safety, uh, heat protective kind of uh, um, policies and measures to protect migrant workers on their work site in, the, in Qatar. But the abuses go beyond that. Obviously, the workers were until recently uh, uh, restricted by the employer visa, uh, the employer related visa, sponsorship visa. Uh, so they could not leave their work had uh, the relationship, if the relationship was not good, if they were being abused in the sense that they were not getting paid, uh, the conditions were appalling, but not solely in the workplace. This also touched accommodation. So when migrant workers come into a country, as um, um, one of my colleagues mentioned earlier, they also relied on accommodation and living in the country. And often this is provided by the company, so by contractors, to the lead companies that need uh, the migrant workers to work on their work site, obviously. So there is obviously a role around work. So understanding the situation of migrant workers that experience in their everyday life in the country. So we hear in Qatar and in many other countries that migrant workers are kept in camps. Uh, some of them may be good, maybe perhaps better than uh, the, the type of lives that uh, workers might have back in their home countries. Okay, I don't know. Uh, in some cases, it's absolutely appalling. So whose responsibility is it? Is it the contractors that run the accommodation? Uh, or is it also a point of leverage from the lead company onto the, this particular contractor that runs the accommodation and the security of the site we're in? Within. Uh, many companies also have integrated the workplace as well as the living space of, um, of their migrant workers. Uh, but they also control the transport. So transport into the city center, for instance, is very important what to access healthcare. Not every company has an infirmary or surgery on place. Uh, if you control heavy the transport, well, there is lack of freedom uh, for the workers to access healthcare, but also to perhaps get a bit of entertainment. So you're not just there uh, into a work camp. I mean, this is something that we really need to get our head around that when you, or migrant workers already in a precarious situation back home. You come into a country, you're highly controlled in your movement and what you can do. Society might not be welcoming to you, but you know, uh, there is perhaps a point to, to, to also check on these sort of things. Um, so yeah, in and around uh, the workplace and beyond. So those companies that basically are recruiting uh, in different countries, need to understand who the recruiters are because most of abuses happen within the recruitment chain. Um, so it happens the moment the, the migrant worker might be looking for work abroad because it is in a pre he's in a, or she's in a precarious situation back home. Um, she wants to send their, her children to school. She wants to provide a decent livelihood to them, decides to work abroad because she finds an ad that say, oh, we're recruiting to go uh, for you to work in Qatar. This is gonna be the wage there, da da da. You see the interview and then fees start building up, right? So you pay in to work. And this payment into work is obviously uh, leading into debt or very often as it were. So um, the, the, this list company that needs to, that, that relies on this migrant work from the convention needs to understand what's happening from the very beginning and due diligence, mapping your supply chains, but mapping your recruitment chains, as it were. So a better way to conceptualize supply chain would be to actually disaggregate it 
in the terms of the type of operation that are happening. So there is a supply chain, but there is a recruitment chain, the accommodation chain, and so on and so forth. So wherever the company's activity might have a point of leverage, a point where it exacerbates certain, certain inequalities, but also term of domination uh, between uh, uh, in the labor arrangement need to be taken into account. So around work, beyond work, you go through the recruitment chain, you map those brokers, those recruit, recruiters that actually bring uh, the migrant workers to the site. And importantly, from the moment the migrant workers is recruited, is being deployed, that no fee is being added to their, uh, their, their, their own. I mean, in the sense that, well, if you get them to pay for the visa, the flights, and then eventually they get into the, the host country and the contract is changed and the fee, the, the, the wages are, are not gonna be as good. The person will, uh, will stay into debt and will not be able to leave their work nor return to their country. Um, so these are all very important aspects. And basically there's been uh, thinking about integrating all those processes, all those activities within uh, the main company. Uh, so that's, way of thinking about vertical integration in order for the lead company to control all the sites. Is it the real solution? Difficult to say, considering the complexity of the migrant life cycle. Thank you, Samantha. And yes, indeed, I think the, the idea of mapping the recruitment chain is, is really important, uh, as you mentioned. I'm not sure if Aitzane wants to comment on, on that or uh, on the recruitment change, or we can just move to another question uh, from Claire Wright. Uh, she thanks all of you for the excellent interventions. And she asks to all the panelists, um, to what extent has the COVID-19 situation affected and maybe even worsened and this situation of migrant workers and how? Um, maybe I'd sign it. Um, yeah, I mean, when when the the pandemic um, started, it was just at the moment when a lot of the migrant uh, workers from Morocco were supposed to come to Spain. So that what happened is that um, almost half of the women that were coming uh, stay, stayed in Morocco and the other half came to Spain. The ones that stayed in Morocco had already signed a contract with some companies, a contract with uh, some specificalities with regards to how long they were going to stay here and everything and nothing happened with regards to them. Like they forgot about them in Morocco and the ones that came here were the ones that had to do the same work from the previous seasons uh, only by, by themselves. And um, that together with the fact that they are again isolated in the Falunans, so nobody knew what was going on in the Falunans. Uh, civil society could not have access to these women because again, we were all in our uh, houses and um, the labor inspections that were going on were virtual inspection so it's what it was very difficult to acknowledge if some abuses were happening in the field and um again what we knew is that these very poor housing conditions together with the lack of a uh, protective um uh, equipment being provided was becoming a problem in the farmlands and at the same time the migrant workers were, that were outside the farmlands in the informal settlements had a problem with um, access to water and sanitation and also a problem with access to healthcare as they are uh, undocumented migrant workers. They do not have access to healthcare provided in every, um, in every possibility. So this was a very complicated situation for all of these workers, uh, although their work were, was considered as essential so they were continued working throughout the, the pandemic. And something that happened at the end is that uh, these women were supposed to go back to their countries in June, but the uh, frontiers between Spain and Morocco were closed. So a lot of these women stayed in the farmlands. The companies started to ask them to pay for the uh, housing. And these women were losing the income that they had and during the time that they were working in Spain. And at the end, it, this developed in, the, in a diplomatic conflict almost between Spain and Morocco and, and how these women were um, uh, returned to, to their country. So of course, yes, 
COVID was a huge issue with regards to these uh, workers. Thank you, Aitzane. Maybe just another question we have here um, for Aitzane, uh, I think maybe related to the migrant worker situation in Spain. It says uh, from Mariana, do you think it's easier to hire women than men? And if yes, why in, in the case of Spain? Or well, how do you see it? It's easier for the companies to um, design a vulnerable, vulnerable profile. Um, and I think that this is what has happened with, with this uh, situation because again, they are, uh, they are mothers of young children, they are widow, they are, or they are divorced, they are the households of their families. So with this very specific um, vulnerable profile, it's very difficult for them to denounce when they face abuses. And again, as women, they face specific abuses uh, that have to do with their gender. And I think that um, when um, um, politicals have been expressly asked about why have you designed this particularly discriminatory selection criteria, the answer is that women are more docile, more careful with the fruits, more um, less or more hard working than men. So I think that it's completely a nonsense that this is the argument that they are um, using to justify the employment of, of women. Thank you, uh, Itzani. And uh, I also have a question for Chiara or for all of you, uh, going back to the, the EU, uh, the upcoming EU directive on mandatory human rights due diligence, and maybe uh, if you can share your views on which elements or aspects do you think would be key to address the, the adverse impacts on, on migrant workers? Maybe Chiara? Um, yes, uh, of course. Uh, obviously, one of the most important factors, um, as we have already discussed, would be to couple mandatory human rights uh, and environmental due diligence with the system of civil remedies uh, at the member state level uh, in order to allow uh, the most vulnerable workers to more easily uh, seek redress uh, in European courts. Um, it could prove to be a politically sensitive aspect uh, during the legislative process and the interaction between the, the three uh, institutions of the EU, but the EU is legally competent to legislate uh, in this area to prevent, uh, in order to prevent re regulatory distortions uh, of the internal market. So this could be definitely um, something to tackle, although as we have already discussed, uh, Opening the courts will not be enough. Uh, the practical, financial, cultural, and gender related barriers to access to justice would have to be tackled. And this is not always easy and even not always possible uh, because of course, uh, there is only so much that EU institutions or a, a due diligence process put in place by, by a European company can do to influence uh, dynamics outside of uh, the EU borders. Uh, having said this, this remains one of the most important uh, um, and paradigm changing contributions potentially. Um, however, it is not the only one. As stated earlier, it would be absolutely crucial to provide for due diligence obligations covering the entire, the entire supply chain. Um, and the commissions could, commission could then issue sector-specific guidance uh, uh, to clarify how due diligence must look like in different sectors, for instance, addressing specific, specific, <laughs> specificities as the ones that uh, my colleagues were referring to regarding intermediaries, uh, uh, accommodation of migrant workers, and so on. Um, it should make sure uh, in issuing such guidance uh, to include a focus on migrant workers as well as as well as on gender and intersectional perspectives. And currently, I have to say, for instance, that the gender perspective is not fully integrated in the Parliament's uh, proposal. So this should be an aspect to tackle. Another one could be um, to uh, include effective stakeholder engagement in the development of sectoral due diligence plan. And uh, this aspect, uh, uh, again, is, is a bit weak in the parliament's proposal. Um, a 2019 uh, OECD FAO pilot project concerning the agricultural supply chain 
highlighted that companies tend to rely excessively on industry-wide audit and certification schemes, adopting a, a one-fits-all uh, methodological approach uh, with the risk of, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting into a box ticking exercise instead of uh, proactive stakeholder engagement and consultation with affected communities. There are provisions uh, on consultation in the Parliament's proposal, but they should be improved. In line with the UNGPs, companies should be required to consult and not only to discuss uh, with potentially affected groups uh, migration status and to intersectional vulnerability. So these are some of the key points uh, on which the, the new directive could, uh, could ignite uh, um, uh, some movements. Thank you, uh, Chiara. And uh, maybe Samantha, I'm not sure if you want to con comment on that and maybe also giving some concluding remarks or hope for the future as well. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Chiara. I mean, the, this point's all very important um, with regard to what should be at least in place to guide companies, uh, obviously beyond compliance, and ask them to look uh, at the legal space that might be uh, man that is managing uh, migration and freedom of movement, as well as uh, the social relation that exists around companies, as well as inside companies. So. Um, on that aspect, I think, um, I mean, I haven't read the text, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm being a lawyer by distance, as it were, <laughs> but it's, I think it's very important to also stress the role that governments have in um, putting regulations, immigration regulations that uh, obviously undermine the rights and freedoms of, uh, of migrant workers class them, segment them, give them status that prevent them to um, enact their rights uh, in many ways. Um, and, and, this, and that this is changing. So this is obviously making the space for companies to understand what their responsibility is in, uh, in, in, in context where there is less migration freedom, less freedom of movement and all that quite difficult. Um, so there is a point where pillar one of the UN guiding principle really should stand in for what mandatory due diligence is. I mean, actually who mandates it, but ask government to also look inwards. And I think the National uh, Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, we're doing that in some ways by asking that government aligns their various immigration or review their various uh, laws, including immigration laws, in order to be in line with, uh, with, with their human right duties, um, <laughs> international human right laws, so that would be already something. Um, so that's important, uh, as, I mean, as I stress, obviously, the point of uh, understanding the, the society uh, where you're in. Uh, if, you're, if you're hiring migrant workers, is hugely important. Um, and yeah, uh, this, is, this is something that uh, sites where, where, com where, where migrant workers will be uh, affected by practices. That's one thing that uh, uh, that um, uh, agents, intermediaries might take uh, to make money out of migration. Migration is an industry; it is a business. Um, so this needs also to be regulated and seen as a business. So when companies uh, are are using intermediaries or using recruitment agencies, what do they need to pay them in order? for the recruitment agencies not to charge the migrants. So what's the responsibility in also changing your business models, your relationship with your suppliers, your contractors needs to be embedded and, and required in this mandatory human right due diligence, uh, I imagine. And that's, um, that's key. I mean, you can't just, as has been done forever, or at least doesn't seem to have changed in many sectors, is that you're placing responsibility downwards um, or upstream, as in you're, you're, you're controlling your primary supplier, but then what happens behind that is absolutely unseen and unchecked uh, by the, the lead company. So this obviously needs to change, but so is uh, a concern that uh, doing responsible business, doing responsible supply chains, recruitment chains has a cost, uh, and you can't always put pressure downwards and then in fact uh, realize that, you know, uh, forget that uh, this type of practice actually pushes informality, precarity, 
down the supply chains and then push people into forced labor. So there is all these cycles that need to be thought through. Uh, and freedoms are not just relational, they also belong into the political economy uh, into which we are. Um, there you go. Uh, maybe a point for business school here <laughs> that, you know, if you're forming managers, um, well, they also need to, to know about human rights, understand their responsibility um, and, uh, and what, what it means. So it's a difficult field uh, to approach in business school, uh, especially because you come in a, in a place where they've learned certain ideas, certain practices. At the same time, we have a trend, a new generation that is looking for sustainability um looking for means to do that in uh in organizations through organization and construct organizations that are respectful of the rights of people and uh protect the planet so maybe this is a time where um business school can do something in that but another point for school of laws i think um and this is something that has been uh i think pushed forward by um, our colleague uh, anita ramasrati you know, what is this, the, the role of lawyers in actually facilitating, protecting companies from their human rights responsibilities? So is there also a need to build in ethics when we teach uh, a corporate law or financial law? I don't know what is done to actually advise businesses as to what they can do uh, to make more profit and so on and so forth. So business school, law school, whatever university have a role in shaping the mind of ethical managers, workers, consumers, whoever we are. And I think that's uh, where I'll stop. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Samantha, also for, for replying about the question on business school that is also so important. Uh, Aitzane, uh, maybe you want to add something to the EU directive and also some concluding remarks as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, something that has uh, come to my mind during the panel all the time is the need to put the rights of the workers in the center and the needs to include them in the processes of due diligence that directly affect them. And in that regard, and thinking on how um, they can access uh, justice and remedy, which is I what I do for for I live in trying to facilitate that access to justice. I think that we have seen that it's so important for um, the companies and the states to provide them with uh, information on the rights and what are the mechanisms they have at their uh, disposal to denounce and the need for these mechanisms to be independent from the companies and also and as uh, Samantha and Emily were saying the need to uh, change migration laws because if during these judicial proceedings they have to return to their homes or they uh, face um expulsions, there is no access to justice at all. So I think that it's important to guarantee residency permits while these proceedings are open and also to include the possibility of bringing their families with them. Because if we think of uh, migrant female workers that come to Spain from Morocco, they leave their families in, in their country and they would want to return to their countries even if they face abuses and they file a civil criminal complaints, whatever. And that possibility might change if they can stay in Spain and they can come and bring back their family. So, I mean, for me, it's like put their uh, realities in the center and acknowledge the realities uh, all the time. Thank you, Aitzane. I think due to the, the time, and I think we can close up here. And again, I would like to thank all the speakers for the insightful presentations, looking at the different complexities, the legislations, uh, women's rights, uh, the importance of the context in around work as well. And finally, Alice will give some uh, final words uh, to everyone. And thank you to, to the audience as well. Alice. So we came to the end of our conference. Once again, thank you to everyone that was present today. Special thanks goes to our expert panelists and, and their very insightful interventions. And to Laura Inigo Alvarez for being an excellent moderation and for all of the, her work alongside myself and Mariana Ferreira in the organization of this panel. I would like to, if you, the audience would like to know more about our current and future projects of the Nova BHRE Center, please follow us on our social media, which I left in the chat for you to see. <laughs>
finally, I remind everyone that we have another conference today at 2 p.m. Please don't miss it. It's about business and human rights in Portugal. See you there and thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.